All right, welcome everyone to Change Notice. Uh, I'm your host here, Tobias, joined by co-host Team Teardown, Will and Chris. Uh, we're gonna wait just a few minutes for the rest of the crew to file in. But in the meantime, I'm super excited about the Amazon Glow. Uh, it's a pretty neat little device with, with a projector, which is, which is new for some of the teardowns here. And we wanna hear from the audience here. Uh, post in the chat, introduce yourself, and tell us about what was your first experience with an interactive projector. We'll tell you a little bit about ours, but think back, think, think about you know the museums where there's some type of projector we can actually interact with. And uh, also make sure the chat, the lower right, that chat is actually set to everyone. So you're not pinging just us. So first interactive projector, what about Will? Yeah, I, I looked at the little glow and it reminded me of this thing I saw in the Exploratorium. It was really just like, if I remember, just a wall of like fluid and you could like move your hand and cause these ripples on the wall of just like big projected light. But it was really cool. It was really fun to play with. I like it. What about you, Chris? Yeah, I was just thinking back to like the first one I ever saw, I think was in the Metreon and it was just like a, like, it looked like an LCD on the ground, but I think it was just a white panel. And there were these like balloons and these little kids were jumping on the balloons and they were spreading around. Uh, but most recently, I actually went to, there's like a, the Team Lab exhibit, I think, at the Asian Art Museum, where it's kind of this immersive, interactive uh, projection. All, all, the entire like walls, everything, the floor, everything was projection. And you're like kind of walking around and all these butterflies are going everywhere. So it's really cool. How about you? Bye. That's, yeah, that's a little, that's a little different. Mine, it might seem a little cheesy, but I'm pretty sure it was one of those projected pianos uh massive pianos on the floor that you jump around to play songs on and i think i tried to imitate the i think it was elf the movie where they're jumping around um fairly unsuccessfully on that on that projected piano <laughs> all right for everyone else joining us now welcome let's get things kicked off here welcome to change notice this is a change notice on snap it's our monthly teardown series where we discuss all things electronic supply chain and manufacturing. I think this is our 13th teardown, lucky number 13 here. So welcome back to our regulars and welcome to the newcomers as well. Our goal here is to, to build a community for, for knowledge sharing, support and continuous improvement. So a few quick reminders, if you do need to duck out, please fill out that survey because that's how we decide what to tear down next. And before I introduce the team here, um, quick disclaimer, as with all our teardowns, we don't have any insider knowledge about these products, but even better, we have our team of experts. So let's introduce team teardown here. Uh, let's start with Will. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Will. This is my second teardown, uh, first one on the Zoom, which is fun. And I come from Apple as a product design engineer. I worked on a host of different products there from, from the watch to Mac desktops and uh, really excited to use that experience to take a look at the glow today. Thanks, Tobias. All right, Chris. Yeah, my name is Chris. Uh, I guess my background is mechanical design. I worked at Amazon for a long time, but before the glow was a concept even, uh, I worked on Kindles um, for seven years. Um, and it's been amazing to see where Amazon has gone since then. Uh, right now, I work at a autonomous tractor startup uh, called Agtonomy. Um, still doing mechanical stuff. And Tobias. All right. So I'm Tobias. Also background mechanical engineering. Was at Apple for about six years, working on phones and watches. A lot of focus on touch sensors and health sensors. So super excited to dive into the Amazon Glow here with Team Teardown. Excited to see the Team Teardown expand too. You can tell we're official with, with the t-shirts. Um, exclusive limited edition. We'll see if we can get some more of these available. <laughs> so agenda for today, we're gonna dive. We're gonna dive into the teardown. Uh, please post any questions. This is meant to be an interactive experience. Post questions in the chat throughout, and then we'll have some more Q&A at the end. And for those of us that missed that intro, uh, again, we're talking about interactive projectors here with the GLOW. 
tell us about if you've ever had an experience with an interactive projector and what that first experience was. We'd love to hear in the chat. So let's let's dive into it. Chris, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I'll just start by showing uh, the basic overview of the product. I don't know how many people have actually used or heard of the Glow before, but it's a it's a new category product from Amazon. I think it started out as one of their um, almost beta tests, like first day one products. Uh, but essentially, it consists of a projector, a display, uh, I think a speaker, some microphones, uh, and it's a pretty big product. And it's supposed to sit on the table. I can't even show you that because it's so tall. Um, and you can interact remotely with like a child or someone else who's um, playing with the projector uh, on the on the table in front of them, and you can control it remotely with their tablet. Um, I was interested in this product because it's something new, right? A very different way. It's like a projector. We don't really see consumer projectors with like touch interaction. Uh, and very curious how they how they do that all in a three hundred dollar product, where normally like a projector itself costs three hundred dollars, let alone including a display, cameras, and all this other stuff. Um, so yeah, it's got a big fan port in the back because uh, it does. I probably need heats up. Um, it's got these neat privacy uh, things uh, to to protect your privacy, so the cameras can. I don't know if you can see that camera can open and close. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the overview of this product. Um, and to get started, basically, uh, I think you know, there's no visible fasteners. Uh, uh, and full disclosure, I did tear this apart once before because. Getting this grill off uh, required a heat gun, um, but um, I'll, now that we've taken it apart once before, it's a little bit easier. I can pry off this front grill. Um, looks like some shiny plastic on the bottom, and then the speaker is right here. And then I got a couple of screwdrivers here. And oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, can you tell what kind of glue they have holding on that grill? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, right now it's not tacky at all, um, which is really interesting. And it does look like it was dispensed uh, just because it's kind of irregular. It doesn't look like a PSA die cut. Um, you know, if I had to guess, it would be like some kind of hot melt glue. Uh, I don't know. Will, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? I think hot melt's a, a pretty good guess here. If it's not tacky, it, it looks like it's kind of an opaque, either epoxy or hot melt like that. But you said it was really strong. Typically, it was. I couldn't, I, could, quite I, strong. I couldn't take it apart in the beginning. I, it could be just that it's, you know, sealed all the way around, plus those snaps were just made it really difficult for me to do it. Um, but yeah, so I got a couple of screws on the bottom. There's, I think if I peeled back, some of these rubber feet that prevent it from sliding around. You can see there's a couple of screws here as well. Um, so I'm gonna take off two of them and see if I can get into this product a little bit more. And yeah, with all that glue and those big beefy screws, it really looks like they want this thing to be robust. Not, uh, not just kind of a minimum needed to put it together, but sealing that thing up. My, I'm wondering if it's like a child proofing kind of thing. <laughs> it's possible also because it's so large and it, you know, it is kind of this oblong shape. If it falls over, maybe there's some kind of uh, more risk of things bending out of place. Um, so they probably needed to use something a little beefier than the small consumer electronics that we usually use, that we usually open up. It, it sounds like Marcel has one of these uh, for for his kid, which which is exciting. Uh, I actually want to show just because we didn't actually get the the live experience of how it works here. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised. Let me see, Chris. Can I I'll share my screen here? Yeah. For a second, again, a lot of the background that people have with interactive projectors is this large scale, again, science museum uh, type of setup. And so I was pleasantly surprised when we were playing around with this projected touch experience. And for those that haven't seen the Amazon Glow, I'm going to show just a quick video here of what it looks like. So it's projecting down. This little white mat is included, but not actually required for the touch. It's projecting down and you can interact via your finger on the mat, which seems reasonable at first. 
I was actually playing around with how sensitive it was. You can see here, you can draw on it. And I was pleasantly surprised with how accurate it was. I even did multiple fingers, uh, multi-touch-esque drawing, and, and it worked. And what I was most curious about is how sensitive it was to proximity down when I actually touch the mat. And you actually have to get pretty close to actually trigger the, the drawing. And I'm not quite sure how they actually are sensing that proximity, how they're sensing that finger touch. So I'm curious to hear from the rest of the audience here, uh, how do you think, what type of sensors are they using to actually track when your finger's touching and drawing around there? Any, any ideas from the audience? Or Chris, what do you think they're using? Yeah, I think there must be some kind of IR sensor, but I don't know, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to hard to tell. Um, but I think there are a couple of these kinds of things. I, I actually worked at Amazon on one of the early Kindles had, uh, before they had the front light, they would put IR touch on there. So you wouldn't, um, so you wouldn't interact, but that had touch like a IR uh, emitters and receivers on the opposite side. Whereas this one, obviously you don't have a receiver. So uh, that was, maybe there's something with IR there. Uh, Will, what do you think? I, I had first thought it was just the projector and a camera. Um, and so when you're telling me that it's really sensitive to just a few millimeters of moving your finger up and down tech to touch, that, I agree. There must be some other kind of sensor in there that they're using, but couldn't tell you what. Only one way to find out. Let's let's take it apart. It's not, we've got some good some good input from the audience here. Chris thinks it might be IR time of flight. Uh, Alec is saying maybe ultrasound or IR. Uh, Mark, video processing to look for shadows. That was kind of the first thought is just the camera and video processing. I would be very impressed if they were able to do that level of, especially the proximity to the table with just, with just video. I think they could do the X, Y movement with video, but that proximity would be tough. Ah, so I did get it open. It sounds really scary when you open it. Just these really large snaps make some very uh, loud pops, but I don't think I broke anything. So uh, there's a couple of flex cables that need to be disconnected from back here. While well, you're getting all those together. cables pulled out, uh, I can pull up a picture of it here. Oh, you got, ah, it. You got it ready you go. to go. Yeah, we can do a quick overview and then, but yeah, I think we'll get into the, to the, to the app a little bit better. You can see it a little bit better, but yeah, so it looks like there's, um, so there's this big speaker chamber here. And then we got the main PCB, which actually is pretty small relative to the size of this product. And then it looks like we got all that, um, that sensor stuff, the, the projector and maybe a camera or something up, up here as well. On the other side, we looks like we have the microphone array board up at the top, a uh, big fan, and then maybe just a simple power cord on the bottom there. Uh, but yeah, why don't we get a closer look on the platform um, so that we can kind of zoom in and, and answer any questions that, that people have. All right, let me pull that up here. So here's the, the same view we were just looking at with Chris. And for those unfamiliar with Instrumental, uh, it's a platform where we pull together data from manufacturing, uh, all sorts of types of data. And in this case, we can take a look at these, the details of this product here. We'll take a look later at the PCB and zoom in at the optical assembly and some other interesting bits later. But first I wanted to take a minute to share just kind of what some of our customers are doing with Instrumental. Uh, we saw Chris taking apart a ton of those little connectors and we've shared in the past how instrumental can be used to look at zip connectors they're always a pain on the assembly line to make sure they're fully inserted and there's sharpie marks all over the place on that amazon product making sure that you know someone has checked each and every one of those connectors but one of the workflows i want to show today is more on the optical side uh, we also have functional test data here in Instrumental, and if you're really trying to do failure analysis quickly and accelerate that whole process, you can take a look at data from testers. 
And if you have this uh, functional data straight and instrumental, you can connect it to your visuals. And anything that fails, you can use our AI to do things like look for potential root causes. So here it's searching through these seven failures and looking for anything on the unit that it's noticed in the pictures without training that could be a root cause. And the kinds of things you see up here, are like scratched lenses, or you might see the position of cameras or optics or alignment or anything like that. So instrumental is a, a really key tool for a lot of customers that are working on products just like the Glow, especially when you're dealing with those tricky failure analysis uh, issues with related to optics and connectors and all these other little assembly issues. So coming back to the, the Glow here, I wanted to dig into some of the connectors here on the board that there, we saw a ton. Did you count how many connectors were on this board, Chris? Let's see, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, <laughs> 15 that I can see from here. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, this is, it's a, kind of amazing to me um, for a product like this, the board is so small, but they just have so much space. Everything's so spread out. Very different working on something that's not not portable here. Mm. Um, but a couple of things I noticed, like for instance, we saw these little uh, coax connectors here, but I didn't see you take any antenna connectors or antennas off the board. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I think. Um, I mean, the whole the whole enclosure is plastic, and they have plenty of space, unlike you know the typical laptop or cell phone. So maybe they have plenty of space to you know avoid any of the metal that normally uh, we see on on products like this yeah that's a great point so it looks like here they just put the antenna straight on the board mm -hmm. which is a great way to cut costs and, and simplify a product what um do you, what do you think the coax cable is for them maybe question for, okay. for the audience it looks like if the antenna is built into the pcb here great great optimization why do they still have a coax connector there. Anyone have ideas? Switch over to a higher resolution image here once we got this torn down. <laughs> mm, Jason connector think, to nowhere. <laughs> either Mark's thinking maybe backup plan. Uh, Scott's thinking tuning, tuning or line testing. Yeah, and Joe's thinking test. Well, what do you guys think, Will and Chris? I think test is a good option there. Um, although, you know, maybe maybe they needed, they looks like they have a backup antenna um, just so they have uh, sort of different locations if you're blocking it with something. And maybe they wanted to guarantee that one is certainly working. And so they they just test the one antenna. Um, but I don't know, it looks like they had space for some, I don't know what those other little dots are there, like that, that uh, silk screen on there. Looks kind of interesting. Yeah, this guy. Yeah. Good question. I think I would probably guess test as well. Maybe yeah. when you have the bare board, they can drive the antenna on the board without all the expensive chips and then make sure that those antennas are tuned right. That makes yep. sense. Yeah, great, great thoughts. I think I think testing is probably a pretty good, pretty good guess there. Um, some other things that I saw here, there's this nice colorful component. You don't see a lot of colors on PCBs, but I think this was a <laughs> button. Is that right, Chris? Yes, this looks like a dome switch that I can press. Um, but, you know, it seems to be completely inaccessible to the user. So kind of curious why they would put a dome switch there. Um, another kind of question in the audience, what do you guys think that dome switch is for? Is it, uh, is it a secret button to do something or uh, oh, getting a couple of responses back? Maybe it's test debug mode. That sounds interesting. Um, Reset, debug, yeah. reset. And then yeah. the other thing I've been looking at is all these all these connectors. You can see these these sharpie marks, making sure someone's checking every single one. But there are a few spots where it looks like they unstuffed connectors. Mm -hmm. You got one over here, got a little label for USB. And uh, I noticed there were no ports on the outside of the product. So what do you guys what do you guys think that was for? Like a uh, feature they removed or just debugging? Well, actually, that's not true that there is a port on the outside, but it's kind of hidden. I'll, I'll show that the next time I, I come back on, um, which is kind of interesting, but it's not a typical USB port. It's, it's, uh, it's looks like a custom connector there. 
But yeah, I, I think maybe when they just have the board itself uh, during development, maybe they do something there for uh, uh, just so they can power it and load firmware and stuff like that on there. I, I have to I have to shout out to Jake's to Jake's response here that that button is, a, <laughs> is an Amazon Prime auto reorder paper towel. You just you just take off the back and you hit that secret button and then the paper towel comes same day delivery. We we, we did make like those kids. the dash the dash buttons they were there I think they they stopped using those but uh, hmm. maybe just integrate them now. Yeah. Uh, maybe they project them on the walls now. So you just, every <laughs> you time to, you walk by, kids are, yeah, you have to find it. That's how it works. Yeah. Chris, I wanted to hear what you thought about this one as well. This looks like, a, you know, more of a traditional ZIF on the outside. Yeah. It's got TOS labeled on it. Yeah. That's you know, I think someone might have, before. someone might have mentioned earlier time of flight as a potential way to do the oh, touch, yeah. but uh, that I think. TOF is commonly used for time of flight uh, abbreviation, but it's not stuff. So maybe TOF is not how they did this, uh, but maybe they did consider that because uh, they wanted to be to, to have a redundancy, or maybe that was a better way of, or not as good a way of, of detecting touch. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, I wonder if it was incorporated in into an earlier design. Again, remembering back to my my days at Apple, we often had parallel paths of multiple designs that were down selected more often than not much later than we would have liked. So we would parallel path multiple designs, um, even up until close close to ramp. And then this could be an artifact of they had decided through some analysis that this sensor wasn't actually needed. And we actually we had a couple customers that were using instrumentals correlation capability because um, it can correlate functional test failures um, to visual anomalies, um, even just other config data where they were able to down select designs earlier on in the process, um, you know, actually be, be able to down select by EVT so that they didn't have to parallel path multiple options through RAM. So that um, that brings back a lot of memories of paralleling parallel pathing far too long, um, but I'm glad that we're helping out customers actually decide earlier. Yeah, I'll um, uh, just, uh, I think I think uh, oftentimes you you make the board and then you don't want to change anything on the board. So you might still put the silk screen and you might still expose those contacts just so that you can uh, not have to change anything as you go into production. Um, so that might have been there quite late. Um, and they were like, well, we don't need it anymore, but it's too late to make the board. Uh, any different. Um, I was showing because I think we mentioned there was no USB, but there is this like six pin port here, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so you could maybe get into the system or program it or do something. Um, and what I thought was interesting is they also have these two um, screw bosses that are sort of melted in there. Uh, so you can create a, uh, a connector on your own. So I think this is a lot cheaper than a than a uh, USB connector on a board and, and maybe a little bit more reliable. Um, but I guess if you don't really need to update it that often once you get Wi-Fi working, um, you can just get away with uh, bare pins. And I think this this reminds me of like when we did the, what was the Echo Show 10? They also had some kind of um, six pin connector, five pin connector. Um, so just some data in and out. Um, also wanted to show briefly, I took the board out and um, because there's so much distance in this, we actually have these relatively large foam that look like they're covered in this conductive fabric. Um, they look like, I don't know, little hourglass shapes, just maybe it makes them springy or something. I thought it was just kind of interesting. And those are the tallest foams I've ever seen. <laughs> but yeah, because I have to go and touch off, looks like on the back of the LCD. Um, which is which is pretty fascinating. One of the other things I thought was interesting, and and maybe we can look back at it, but the some of these flex cables look like they go in from the front and they snap on the back, and some of them look like they snap on the front. And kind of curious what people's thoughts are on why some of them would would need to do that, um, or or will if you have any uh, thoughts or Tobias as well. 
I mean, I, the only thing I can think of from my experience is that it depends on the supplier. You know, some <laughs> some vendors make five pin connectors, some vendors make eight pin connectors, and they just have different designs. Like, I don't know. Does anyone think there's a, a benefit to having the latch on the front or the back of the connector? Oh, Marcel has an interesting point of maybe if you're designing for the assembly, a lever on one side is actually easier for the operator to get into because you need more space for, for them to actually get into. Uh, that's a very optimistic, sort of very, very thoughtful design decision, which, which could be, which would be pretty imp impressive. My, my initial assumption was similar to you, Will, is for the given, you need 22 pins and you need it to be this pitch that there's just a limited number of suppliers that are qualified. And so it's just kind of luck of the draw of uh, this connector happened to have a latch on the front or back. Because I know that's um, how it ended up a lot of times when we were selecting connectors is there's not that many options if you need a super fine pitch to fit in this exact footprint. I had one yeah. other thought, and it has to do with the fact that this um, device is made to stand up and maybe like the longer like if the tail is at the back maybe you have a farther travel into the connector so you have more so it says gravity is tugging something down maybe uh the ones on the bottom seem to have more of these kinds of connectors and so maybe it's like a another just you have more space for the the cable to fit into the connector before you, you latch it down but yeah i think otherwise it's it's usually just <laughs> The different sizes um, that are out there. Um, so it looks like this this next module that we wanted to take out is the optical sensor module, and it has you know just held down by four screws. Um, but that's kind of what it looks like here. Um, also, some interesting thing is this. This is the uh, there's like the privacy filter thing, and it's like that kind of a neat mechanism where you can see it kind of go. It actually moves two things. So there's the uh, front camera, and then it looks like there's a different camera here that, that kind of blocks both. So if you wanted to make it really private, it blocks all of these things with a physical shutter. So I thought that was kind of neat. And then the other thing is interesting is some of these cables are a little bit different. Like this one actually looks like you can see the individual wires, um, whereas these other ones look more like the traditional flex cable that I'm used to, like where they're kind of custom shaped. Um, so curious why people think we have a combination of different things out there. Um, but yeah, maybe Will, if you wanted to take a closer look at some of these different things while people answer some questions, uh, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Let me stop sharing. I had one yeah. question on the the ZIF connectors quick before oh, we yeah. did that. I saw a bunch of tape, I think, on the on half of the ZIF connectors. Mm -hmm. uh, Will, if you want to pull that up. So there's tape on the left ones but not on the right ones. Why, again, question for the audience. Talking about these pieces of cap down tape here that are over the top. Yeah, it looked like it looked like after the zip was inserted and latched down that they added some cap down tape. Uh, why do you guys think that, why do you guys think that that tape is present and why just those flexes? Do you have any thoughts, Will? Oh man, uh, <laughs> all I can think of is they did some reliability tests and those were the ones that popped out. So <laughs> I would have put tape on all of them, but maybe they just put ones on the ones that had issues. But uh, it's a good question. What do you guys think? I, yeah, I would agree. I think, uh, I think reliability is probably what happened here just because these are really sensitive components. And, um, you know, actually some of these cables are pretty big. And so if, if they kind of get a, enough force on a, like side impact or like a, I don't know what we use, like a corner flop impact, basically, maybe it could come loose. Um, and so they wanted to do extra, extra protection on those. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, the more I look at it, I think you're right, Chris, those are the really beefy flexes. I think they're stiffer. And also there may be something about the orientation of, um, of those zips of kind of a repeated set down that those are somehow more susceptible to reliability. I know there are a lot of horror stories about ZIF reliability. Um, I remember our reliability team, there was a constant debate about 
did it pop out during the reliability during the drop event or was it misinserted at time zero like that's the concept is a processor rel issue and i think that's what those marks are to help with um but we actually had uh if i can show here for a second will uh back on your story uh we had some reliability teams that were using the the traceable images because if you actually have an image at time zero you can conclusively prove was it inserted correctly to start <laughs> or was it a reliability issue so like for example um we had one consumer electronics customer similar to what we're looking at here again you've got pictures of time zero you can just sort through you can either search for that specific rel failure serial number or you can actually just sort through and have instrumentals ai uh, automatically look for anomalies and in this specific case uh there was uh here you can see some unlatched zips that's pretty obvious but the slightly ajar zips these ones don't always get caught by functional tests and these were the ones that they were struggling with and so they were able to root cause boom process issue not reliability issue which i know the rel team was uh pretty excited that they had that conclusive evidence yeah that's doubly hard when you have those really wide stiff zips because mm -hmm. if anything shifted just ever so slightly it's not going to want to bend to go in straight it's going to want to just come in at an angle because it's so stiff in that direction the the other theory i do want to throw out is may, it might be an assembly process thing where maybe those zips are put in very early in the assembly and then the tapes go down and say no touchy and they do a bunch <laughs> of other assembly steps before yeah. the rest of those zips go in and so it's just to protect them in process but just like you were talking about tobias you know e even if it's all in process you want to know are these issues being was it good when it went in did it get caused later in the process trying to figure out where these issues happen in your process is just an absolute nightmare so having that traceability is huge yeah excellent um all right yeah and also from the audience uh let us know which areas you want us to uh, to spend some more time on uh, i know we're going on a ziff rant here because we all have some some <laughs> horror stories in the past yes do you really <laughs> but if there's a specific area um i know we're we're super excited to look at the optical module and some of the, the sensors there um if we want to dive into the speaker we can do that let us know what you want us to to dive into um well i'll i'll hand it back um to you if you want to dive in um should we look at should we look at a close-up of what that projector looks like looks like marcel wants to look at that yeah <laughs> let me pull that up so we got a close-up image here we got three different optical uh components in this uh really cool metal um frame it's kind of got these built-in heat sink fins and all of the assembly features you need as well as a uh, place for routing all these different flexes and foams um what yeah i have a hard time just at first glance figuring out what each of these things does though and any clues from the assembly chris um well uh the I'll, big I'll send it back to you as well oh sure that's fine i would say here we can see this here so there's this big wire that uh, I think usually it has, has sort of has red, green, blue wires kind of in it. Um, usually some kind of power or maybe signal wires for that. It's going into this large thing with the big heat sink. And, and that kind of hints to me that this is probably the projector. <laughs> and it's also in the center and right where where the, the image uh, was coming out from the, from the device. So I think that's pretty much there. Uh, that's the projector. This one looks like it has a lens on it, so I would say that's the camera. Um, it's also, you know, got uh, looks like it has a, a flex cable here, so that they can uh, adjust it and line it up pretty well. Um, outside of where this flex also needs to route through, um, and then this one, I would say this is probably some kind of IR thing. You know, we 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 think it's an IR. Um, based system. So maybe this is a way for uh, either light to come out from the overhead view. Um, but that's that's kind of what I would suspect. 
Some other interesting things you can see here is there's like this spring here. There's a couple of springs on this um, on the projector assembly. So they're they're really trying to position that um, I think pretty well. And it's also glued in place. So once it's locked and maybe calibrated into where it needs to go, they just kind of glue it shut so you can't remove this. <laughs> Man, that is just a, a flex octopus. I yeah. Think you got one cable and four flex connectors coming out. Am I seeing yeah. that right? Uh, there are, I think there are three flex cables that I can see, but yes, I think there are three. The, the fourth one, I think, is the display on the on there. But yes, there are quite a bit of things uh, going on here. Yeah, putting that together must be a really manually uh, challenging process, especially with those optics. The alignment is so important. Yeah. Uh, it looks like they do have sort of the pin and slot locating features above where the screws need to go. But another interesting thing is these, uh, these sensors are actually at an angle. You can kind of see that if I hold it like there. So, uh -huh. so they have to tap these holes at this, you know, maybe 20 degree angle or whatever this is. Um, and so the pin and slot also need to be cast, I think, at that angle, which is kind of interesting, just because the way to make this tool, maybe they're coming off at a, at a different angle for that. Uh, looks like a die cast um, housing. But yeah, I don't know if you want to take a look even more at the, uh, if there's anything you wanted to zoom into a little bit further or. One thing I wonder, uh, so Joe's asking about the alignment, which I think is really interesting. You pointed out. So it looks like both, if we're assuming on the right there, that some, some type of camera and some type of IR projector mm -hmm. on the left. Um, I'm guessing that's a gasket on the right camera. Yeah. Uh, that's probably, that kind of reminds me uh, back in the mm -hmm. Apple Watch optical sensors. Again, on the back of the watch, there's an IR light that's used for prox sensing as well as heart rate. And we had tons of issues with, we called it crosstalk, which is when that IR emitter on the left uh, is blasting light and just internally, if that IR light gets over to the camera. So I'm guessing that gasket is to prevent that light getting in. Um, and it's, it's probably gonna be manually placed would be my guess. I know we've got a couple of customers with gaskets that they're using instrumental for but one actually really unique use case is uh, we have customers that are taking video of that assembly, of these manual assembly steps. And actually, I wonder, we could probably demo it here to show the video because that's a, an exciting new addition to the instrumental platform. Because not only do you get that, that image, but you can see, you know, did the operator accidentally poke something nearby Let's see, uh, can we bring up our, our video streams expert, Noi, to, to give us a quick demo here. Let's see if we can get her up. There we go, perfect timing. Hey guys, can you hear me? Welcome, Noi. Welcome. Awesome. Thanks for having me join. Uh, for those I haven't met, I'm Noi, and I'm a solutions architect at Instrumental. This is my first time actively being in a teardown, so thanks for having me. It's been fun <laughs> to listen in so far. <laughs> um, so as Chris and Will kind of talked us through, uh, between the flexes, lenses, glue, gaskets, springs, this is a pretty complex assembly. And so as Tobias said, we thought this would kind of be an interesting application for Instrumental's video streams. So I'll go ahead and share my screen, and you can see what video streams looks like in the Instrumental app. Um, so as you can see, uh, this provides an instant replay of the assembly for specific units that are being built on your line. So traditionally, an Amazon Glow engineer uh, doing failure analysis on this projector assembly might fly to the factory, stand over the line, and look for any variation that could be causing failures. Um, so they might look at screw patterns, look whether SOPs are being followed, the list goes on and on. Uh, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that process. So our customers typically use video streams to overcome that slow and challenging failure analysis process. Um, you can instantly get that video of your product, see it alongside any test data results, measurements, and images. So this really provides a complete view of the product uh, to get you answers quickly and accelerate your failure analysis. 
Uh, I'm curious for those in the audience, maybe you can throw into the chat, if you could have any consistent video of a process on your lines, what would you wanna see? Um, and Tobias, Will, and Chris, I'm curious, how do you think video streams might have helped you back in your days at Apple and Amazon? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, yeah, I'm I'm excited to hear from the audience as well. It's like the what are those tricky manual assembly steps that you would want video for? The yeah, the first few things that jump to my mind are anything that is manual. Um, either so I was mentioning gasket placement. That's a pretty simple, just kind of one step. Put it down. Uh, biggest risk there is you're damaging something. I think the uh, the one that I remember is a flex bending for the touch and display module. So it was on it was on the iPhone. You're putting in. Uh, it's kind of a tricky process. You have to like tow it in, and then it's partially bent up. And then they take the flex and kind of bend it around and plug it in, and then you close it up. And that was a very delicate process because if you tug on the flex at all, you damage traces on either the display or the touch flex, and you don't know about it. Sometimes it's like partially damaged. So I would have loved to see a video to be able to trace back when you know you have failures in the field, you have failures in rel. I want to go back to that video and see what the operator did. I don't know. Will, Will and Chris. That's uh, flex routing for me too. I'm, I'm looking at this assembly here and I see there's this part here on the right where this flex runs through this little hole. And it reminds me of this process where we had, where we spent months designing this whole pre-bend special fixture and you would put the part in and it would bend the flex at just the right location. And then I went and I watched the operator and they would just like take tweezers and increase the flex wherever they could to shove it through that hole and poke it through the hole. And the whole pre-bend thing was a complete waste of time. And I never would have known that if I hadn't spent a few hours just sitting there behind the operator, watching them try and get the flex through this tiny hole and learned a lot about uh, flex design and routing based on really having to make it assemblable too. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, similar stories with flexes, but we had these pressure sensitive flexes on the sides of the Kindle Touch or actually Kindle Voyage. And uh, we just couldn't get them to work right. We weren't sure if it was, uh, and, and once you assembled the top uh, cover lens to the enclosure, we basically sealed it and with, it's like a VHB tape basically. And so getting that apart and then you would, we'd even separate layers of the flex. So we weren't sure, did we install the flex correctly? Was it um, glued in properly? Was there something different with the flex cable itself? Um, and so I could certainly see something where you could get images of every product so we could test, you know, the the range of, of sensitivities of those of those touch uh, touch sensors um, would be really would have been really helpful and saved us uh, probably months of time, honestly. <laughs> we had uh, we had a few more questions here. Well, first, one other feedback uh, uh, from Keith on adhesive dispense video that one's that one's really interesting we have a lot of customers that are using instrumentals imaging for adhesive dispense look for bubble shape abnormalities but video would be even more interesting especially with manual adhesive dispenses no question there where do they start where do they stop how much of the trail of the glue uh overflows on other parts of the product <laughs> oh I, a better one <laughs> yeah. how much glue did they dispense that the operator then just wiped off afterwards oh yeah <laughs> how many times did they dispense maybe they didn't get it in the right spot so they just do it two or three more times to fill the whole thing up <laughs> oh one other thing i had one for liquid dispense was um we used a, like a liquid optically clear adhesive on one of our uh, um, doing our first sort of touch screen kindle like this and um, we had it in a clean room. We we're just kind of trying to figure out why are we still getting contamination? And we're like, they have to clean it, use alcohol. They, they go in, they put on the bunny suit, whatever. And then uh, we found out because we were on the line that sometimes the operator would see particles of dust and they would blow them away just mm -hmm. with, their, with their mouth and just blow it away. And we're like, this is not clean in any sense of the word. Like we're making it clean is what the operators would say. So. Mm -hmm. If we could have known that, we could have maybe avoided, uh, you know, thousands of dollars in lost um, products because <laughs> displays were not useful. <laughs> we weren't sure how, how to control that process. 
we had we had a few questions here that we want to touch on to make sure again for the for the audience here let us know what else you want to dive into i know we can still look at the the speaker and what's in that bottom compartment uh, i think there's one more flex running down there so we should take a look but let's see eric wanted to look um or actually no first i think there was a question to look back at that shutter mechanism a little bit closer uh okay. can you show that again chris the the nifty little dual shutter mechanism let's see it's kind of overexposing but we'll do this so i'm just pushing this button on the side here and there's this track you can kind of see uh it's kind of this s-shaped track right here um and it has like a, a vertical point on each end so you get this kind of locking mechanism or locking feeling and kind of just a squeeze um so you kind of definitely in the in the home position um but yeah so i think you can see there's this opening here for that camera and it closes and then there's this other opening here and so it just has like a semicircular uh maybe some kind of plastic tab or or something that just comes down uh, and that's all based on this sliding mechanism here so they have these uh two pins and it just they're just tied to each other like that pretty neat and i think as well so when i was playing around with it when it was live when you close the shutter it actually disables a good portion of the device so i think there's actually a sensor somewhere because that's just mechanical how does it sense how does it sense when the shutter is closed so no one to disable those features so it looks like there's a little switch here uh, that there it is. gets depressed as you go over it like this. So it just, just gets moved. Uh, and that, I think, detects whether the switch is all the way in the down position or not. Um, so not only do you optically or physically close it off, but you also can electrically turn it off. So you're not wasting the power for all those things when it's in that, in that state. Um, like a, that's a really clever design. Yeah, so the, you know, yeah, go ahead. I know I'm the, the big question that I still have here is you have the projection module where you have the what looked like a camera also to do some tracking of the finger and some type of IR projector. Is that the only sensor that's actually for touch input? And is that accurate enough to to be able to tell that that proximity or is there something else? Because that seems too good to be true if they can sense all that just from an IR sensor way up top. I think one of the challenges you have from just looking from above is, you know, if my like if, if I look here, you don't know, or you know, maybe the size of my finger relative to this is not like larger than the the echo or the the Amazon Glow, but um, I don't necessarily know when I'm touching something or not. So I think there is. Uh, something else at the bottom here um, that might help us understand this a little bit better. The other thing, as I'm taking out the speaker module, I thought I'd share it. Is, look how big the head on this screw is. So if I turn it over, the screw itself is that tiny little thing. And the head is this really large um, flange. Um, so I thought that was a really clever way to not have to use like a washer or something else on here. Uh, yeah, that's wild. I thought that was a washer when you pulled it off. I don't <laughs> think I've ever seen a screw with that all just kind of formed in this one piece. Yeah, I think so. This way the screw machine works, like you just kind of slam it and then you you thread the thing. And so uh, you thread the, the, the shaft. So I guess if you just slam it a little further away, you can get more material to spread out. Um, but yeah, I think that's it's kind of interesting how they did that. But looks like I'm taking off a couple more screws here. Oops, let me get my screwdriver in this. Yeah, there we go. Looks I like Joe, there's there was a comment here about uh, body occlusion and uh, the camera projector alignment for sensing from above. Uh, it makes me think of some of my friends working in the LIDAR industry for autonomous vehicles. 
and you know short of having a several thousand dollar highly calibrated laser accurate fine-tuned device like it would be very very difficult from above to be able to get that level of sensitivity yeah so as i took off um a couple of these different screws here but i i can show this really briefly i think it yeah looks like there's a pretty interesting little board and uh, looks like some kind of lenses on the bottom here. Maybe we can flip back to Will so he can get in a closer look at this while I take this speaker module off. Yeah, I can pull that up. All right, so I'll just work our way through the assembly here. We got our board, and I think that's what we're looking for here. Yep. So this guy has a little board in it. I uh, got a zip to connect it to the main PCB, and then these two little zips to flexes. Uh, that go to these little modules kind of looks like they're the same um, from first glance and then these modules are pointing out towards these little plastic kind of transparent plastic pieces that uh, shoot out the front of the product and we were talking about this earlier trying to figure out you know what aligns with what here so i'll draw some lines on here for everyone to see you can see how the center of these modules are lined up just right with that little V cut in the plastic. Uh, so we, yeah, we spent some time trying to figure out what these do and any thoughts from the audience on how, what this thing is even doing? So I, I'm curious, curious to hear what other, users. what other yeah, people, I, I had originally thought that it might be some type of prox sensor, like one emitter and one detector, like we saw on, again, a lot of other products that we've torn down. But it looks like, is it the same module on both sides, Will? Uh, it's hard to tell. You know what I'll do is I'll look at the part number. <laughs> and looking at the part number, they are a little bit different. This is G102. This is G101. <laughs> But that could be a left and a right. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe it's just how the, the flex angles that way, right? So <laughs> one is angling to the left and one is angling to the right. Oh, yeah, so Mark, Mark was asking here, just as a reference, where this is on the product. This is, um, maybe Chris, if you want to show quickly, this is way down at the base, at the bottom, pointed outwards. Are you able to show that? that Chris yeah so here's is the display the camera module part and then what I'm looking at right here is this module and it's like facing so if I were to put this on the ground let's it's see it's right in the foot it's on the foot yeah it's right below the speaker um, which is very close to the bottom of this product actually yeah, so Mark, Mark's wondering, could this be measuring the distance of the finger above the surface? Um, Marcel's wondering if that's our touch sensing. I think I think originally I thought like, oh, yeah, no, it's just some LEDs for indication down there. But it it definitely is involved somehow in the, the touch sensing. And I think that's how they're doing the, the more granular proximity sensing, like Chris was mentioning. Um, it almost looks like, well, if you want to pull that back up, uh, it almost looks like those are both emitters. Um, I'm guessing this is all IR because we think that that camera above is IR. Those are both emitters. And from this design here, it looks like it's just going into that little V shape. And that's almost uh, a diffuser that's then emitting this IR light in a small plane out onto that touch surface and that that seems pretty clever if that's then projecting out i'm still not 100 percent sure uh, if anyone else has experience with how that then muxes with the ir from above and the ir camera to precisely uh triangulate exactly where your fingers going but it's definitely related to the touch yeah, I'd, I have to say the fact that there's two of them really is giving me triangulation vibes. Yeah. So it makes me think of, uh, you know, touch grid arrays where maybe they pulse these at different frequencies or different times and, you know, do a scan and they check when does this 
does any light off of this emitter get reflected back up into the camera and then they turn that one off and then they turn on the other one check does any light from that sensor or emitter get reflected back up to the camera um, and by constantly going back and forth and checking them they can compare the two signals and do some kind of triangulation i think i think that's pretty clever this is a pretty clever way to to be able to do this level of uh of touch detection in uh a fairly compact inexpensive product overall so props props to the team there uh, yeah, i mean i wonder i wonder if they used that they had that third what we think is a third emitter from the top right so they're the one above and two from the bottom i wonder if they're using that for like extra uh because i think tobias when we tested it we kind of covered the one side and and it could still function right you could still detect everything um, so it seems like they're using the camera to do a bunch of stuff um, to detect. Yeah, uh, Mark. Mark had one one really interesting idea here. Is if it's yeah, is the is the IR? Is it a plane of IR? And then your finger is just blocking a certain path of light. So then the IR camera just sees a full plane of IR minus whatever shadowed area. Um, and that like would be projected on the ground, and it's looking for the shadows kind of thing. Yeah, it's just looking for an IR shadow on on the ground, um, which yeah, which is a pretty reasonable guess there. And Joe's referring to some old low cost touch that implemented this way, which I think Chris, you mentioned that the old Kindles used to do this as well, actually on the touch screen. Yeah, I think I was looking up also uh, ATM, uh, not machines, but ATMs uh, <laughs> use the uh, used to use these as well because they could cover larger areas. Um, so instead of having a very large, expensive, like ITO touch, you know, like um, sputtered on the back of a 60 by six, whatever size screen, they could just use these IR emitters and, and, and receivers. Um, but I think the interesting thing they're using is the two. So if you, because I think Tobias, you said you were able to get maybe like two finger touch and just draw lines or something like that used to be that you would just block one side and you couldn't see what's behind. So by using two of them, maybe you can actually see a little bit more um, and create a little bit more of a shadow mm -hmm. uh, or get a, get around the shadow effect. Um, yeah, it's a good point. It's a neat design. Well, we're, we're almost at time here. So thank you for everyone who's, who's posting in questions and contributing to our answers as well. Uh, any more, any more questions, final questions, get them in now before we wrap up. Um, a question about how difficult it is to get the functional tests into our system. Uh, Will, you want to touch on that as uh, as an expert? Sure. Yeah, I assume you're asking about when I was showing those camera those camera results earlier on that Rilo example. It's really straightforward. Um, basically, anything that you can put in a CSV file, uh, we have an integration team and a series of scripts that will parse it and pull it straight into the app. So. Uh, we make it as easy as possible because we know no one really wants to spend their time doing integrations and it's really you want to spend your time solving problems i think there was a question earlier that carson asked is there a common screw supplier for devices like this um i think in my experience you just kind of find a different vendor and you can customize these screws um to whatever you want and you're basically looking for both the cheapest price and the uh, best quality for that low price um what i don't know about your you guys experience with screws that was my experience and because there are so many suppliers you would often have two or three different suppliers to try and oh. drive down costs and have backup supply chains so they're, they're pretty easy to find screw suppliers but we were talking about connectors before unless you're a company like apple mm -hmm. you know where you can make every single connector custom for you those are typically there's a there's a catalog and you pick one out of the catalog because <laughs> it can be a year to develop tooling to even move something a few microns left or right in those connectors. They're, yeah. they're actually quite complicated little things. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're just at time. Let's let's wrap it up there. A few reminders at the end. Um, first, thank you to the audience. Uh, your knowledge here is is very interesting for us to to learn as well. So we really appreciate the participation. Thanks to Team Teardown, Will, Chris, and Noy. Uh, if you want a, a more detailed demo of the platform, uh, we can take a look at images that you have and even try out some of our AI. Send over an email to communications at instrumental 
fill out that survey to tell us what to tear down next. We keep finding these exciting new devices like the Amazon Glow. So let us know if there's something out there that we're missing. And we're uh, September 29th, our next teardown, the Sonos Roam. But we have a, a very exciting guest, Ron Roberts, a distinguished mechanical engineer from Sonos, is actually going to join us. So super pumped for that. Links in the comments right now. Sign up for that. And September 20th, we're actually releasing our state of mass production webinar. We had 300 uh, operations engineers that actually submitted feedback about some of the challenges that they're having with mass production. And so we've aggregated all that data and we're gonna be presenting that. So that's September 20th. Uh, otherwise, thank you again for joining and thank you to Team Teardown. We'll see you all next time. Manufacturing has changed and hitting yield targets, deadlines, and quality goals is harder than ever. Instrumental is the first manufacturing optimization platform designed to help both engineering and operations teams ramp successfully on every program by finding and fixing issues at the source and making sure they don't come back. From development through mass production, Instrumental is helping the world's most innovative brands and contract manufacturers accelerate failure analysis and drive continuous improvement by easily unifying their product data into one secure cloud-based hub. And you can get started in less than one week. Using images, video, machine parameters, functional tests, measurements, supplier and return center data, Instrumental makes collecting data and finding correlations easy. Our AI surfaces the most meaningful relationships among your data sets, so you can find the root cause fast. Starting with your first build, Instrumental proactively identifies new issues by scanning your products for anomalies in visual or functional test data and automatically delivering net new discoveries. In development, Engineers can jumpstart failure analysis with defects in context by leveraging a rich remote data set. With Instrumental, they can quickly identify correlations and potential root causes, and even push live tests to validate solutions immediately, eliminating issues at the source. In mass production, you can monitor throughout, get alerted of shifts, and identify correlations to root cause, unexpected drift, redundant tests, and operator issues. When installed across factories in a supply chain, brands and suppliers are able to stop working against each other and start working together to solve their most complex issues. Better products start with better data. Better products start with instrumental. Schedule a demo today.